Are you going to bark at Gabriel? Hey guys. Hey handsome. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Hank. What's up? Good morning. Miss Reba here. She's still limping. And it's been an on and off thing for the last like month. And we have a vet coming out today to look at her. It's obviously not an emergency, but something I want to get checked out. So here's Clover. And then back here, her little babies are all snuggled up in the corner. But we had a little something happen the other night. Margot became a mama for the first time. Now you'll notice I've got Margot in here with Maggie. We bred all of our goats. Um, we put the La all in at the same time. Normally I don't do that. Normally I would stagger breed and only breed two at a time through the fall to have kids in the late winter and spring because normally this is the barn I have that has two stalls. Well, we knew we were putting up a new barn and it was supposed to be here at the beginning of December and it's been very delayed. Now I think it's supposed to be here in two weeks. Obviously, um, things happen, that's okay. But the reason I put all my goats in at once is because I was planning on having this barn and the new barn, in which case I was gonna have six stalls and having five goats give birth at the same time wasn't a problem. And now, instead, I have two stalls and five goats, well, I had five goats that were mm -hmm. pregnant and due around the same time, and two have already kitted. Maggie is really pretty close, I think. Um, not like, I, I don't think she'll have them today. I can still feel her ligaments, but I do want to keep her isolated. And Margot is actually Maggie's baby. She's her grown baby. And so they have a relationship. Goats are kind of interesting. They do form like bonds and relationships. Now I would never have put Margot in with Clover because Clover is like one of the herd dames. Like she kind of runs the show. She's really aggressive towards the other goats. And I would not have wanted to put Margot with her new babies in with a goat that is aggressive towards her but Maggie is never that way towards Margot because obviously she's her mom and they do have like a, a close relationship and so they're okay in together. Let me show you guys this tiny one. Look at this little mini me of Miss Margot. So you guys ready for a little baby goat birth story uh -huh. time? Um, the other night, I had already gone to bed and was almost completely asleep. And Maya comes in the front door and he had gone outside to just lock everything up and just make sure everything was closed up. You know, we have like tool trailers and different stuff like that. Just make sure it was all put up. He walked out and heard something next door and he came and yelled through the front door, Jess, get up, get dressed, come outside. And I could hear the like alarm in his voice, which is not a good thing in the middle of the night. I mean, ever, but specifically on a farm, when you hear that call, you know something is not okay or is an emergency. And I uh, jumped up, was throwing layers of warm clothes on and my boots and stuff like that and ran out front. And as soon as I was out front, I could hear what he was talking about. I could hear a baby goat crying next door where there weren't any baby goats and um he said something's wrong i don't know what's going on but i hear babies and so it's dark and we ran over there and i found the larger doling first and then we ended up finding the much smaller doling about 25 feet away and margo had cleaned them off she's a first time mom I had checked her earlier that day and she did not seem apparently close, but again, my goat seemed to be trying to prove a point and make it seem like I don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, she cleaned them off, but she got freaked out, which is, is kind of a common thing for goats. Thankfully, we just had a storm and it was like a southern storm that had come up and it had brought a warm front with it. And so it was like 60 degrees randomly for like three or four hours and that night and it was a light rain but it was up 60 degrees and so thankfully it wasn't as cold as it has been before that storm and after it's gotten cold again because that could have honestly just that short of a time with babies this small it, it could have killed them but we got Margot moved into the stall and with her two little dolings 
and they are doing really well in here. Now I made some little sweaters for them out of um, sleeves from a sweater I had in my get rid of pile. It had gotten damaged, but the sleeves were still good, so I cut the ends of the sleeves off and cut them some little armholes in there because they're just, they're kind of small and sometimes with smaller goats, they'll have a hard time holding their their body heat. And so far, they're, they're eating pretty well and they're really, really sweet. So, Margo's not full La Mancha. Maggie is half La Mancha and half Nubian. Margo is three quarter La Mancha and one quarter Nubian, obviously. And then her babies are, she's bred to La Mancha, so they're mostly La Mancha. And you can really say that this one really looks looks like it and then the other one has little pixie ears like her mama but i feel pretty good about how they are i was a little nervous with these that first night like i came out here and checked on them a lot i checked on them a lot yesterday morning and through the day but i'm starting to feel a little more at ease about them they just they were having a really hard time they were staying they were shivering a lot but they're continuing to eat there is a light in here and I'm just watching really closely to make sure that she continues to take good care of them and they don't start acting weird. It's actually sweet. Maggie has been a, a little sweetie. She's cleaning them off a lot too and loving on them. So they're getting some granny time too, huh, granny mags? They've tried to nurse on her a few times. She doesn't let them do that, but she'll, she'll lick on them and uh, nuzzle them and stuff like that. We did end up settling on names, which I'm still using some names from Poldark, and then we're gonna start with the Downton Abbey names. So there's a little bit of a mix here. These two are Verity and Violet, and we went ahead, and I did this for my mom because I said something the other day about if I do the Downton Abbey names, we'll have to have a Mary. And my mom messaged me, and she was like, oh, it would be so great. I would be okay with it if you named a goat Mary, because my mom's name is Mary. So over here, the beautiful little black and white doling is gonna be a Lady Mary. I genuinely can't believe that we got three dolings. Um, we have always had an inordinate amount of bucklings on our farm, always. Like I remember one year we had 14 kids and like 10 of them were bucklings, which is really kind of a bummer if you're trying to grow your herd. But three out of four so far have been girls and it'd be really cool if that kept up and was a trend with this year's kidding. Since getting surprised with another set of kids, when I'm checking, I have gotten really uh, intense about checking. I've been going over there about six times a day and making sure that nobody is showing any signs of impending labor. And that's why I'm not taking Maggie out because so, right now she looks the closest. And though it is uncomfortable with the barn situation because it's cold, there is actually kind of benefit to them all kidding at the same time because we can just keep all the kids on the same schedule as far as just taking care of the things they need and whenever we start separating them at night and then later when it comes time to wean them, it'll just all be the same. What are you so excited about? <laughs> Silly boy. <laughs> Look at my little cauliflowers turning into plants over here, not, not seedlings anymore. It's really about time to start cleaning in here. I need to clean all this stuff out and just get ready for what's going to come in next. We've now eaten almost all of our Brussels sprouts. I've still got some that were just sort of small. And then over here I have um, about eight more stalks. Uh, some of them have decent growth on them, but they're just a little on the smaller side, so... I'm just waiting to harvest them. Homegrown Brussels sprouts are like a revelation. Seriously, I know that I'm constantly like heralding the news that homegrown food tastes so much better. It is a massive motivator for me in growing a garden. Uh, that so many things, they just have such a different flavor whenever they're grown in your yard where you get to eat them really, really fresh. I think that's one of the key points. You get to pick them at optimum ripeness and eat them really fresh. These homegrown Brussels sprouts are unlike anything I've ever had before. And usually, like if we buy Brussels sprouts at the store, they're good, but the texture is different. I would say the flavor is very similar. It's a very similar flavor. But we've been roasting these and I don't know exactly how to, like my mouth is watering. Like I don't even know how to describe it, but 
it sounds silly to be like they're melt in your mouth brussels sprouts but they are like the flavor is so or the texture is so light they're not at all like tough or woody they're so soft oh my gosh they're so good and i have attempted to grow brussels sprouts for years and i'm curious if like the amazingness of them like is the texture because they were grown this time of year because they were grown in the high tunnel because they you know it has been freezing in here so i know people told me that it was important for brussels sprouts to experience a freeze i don't know what all the factors are because this is my first time successfully doing it but i am a believer in the brussels sprout growing at the house they're genuinely amazing I still have a few stalks here that are pretty loaded to look forward to. Like that one looks pretty good. Like this one looks pretty good. I tried different things. Like I, I, I pulled some of the lower leaves off. Like these, obviously, I didn't get them all off. People said that would help them develop. I don't know. I felt pretty good about it. So whenever I was planning my uh, kind of garden to do list for this spring, I had put like February 1st through 5th clean out and reset the high tunnel um now there's still a lot of food in here obviously a lot of the root vegetables and the kale are still in really good shape and so i'm not going to take everything out but basically i'm going to take some sections out and kind of start cleaning them out especially these things that are completely spent i'll start obviously cleaning that out and i'm going to be planning one more wave of cold weather stuff and I'm gonna get it planted really soon, like this week. And then when all of that stuff is finishing up, it should be like through the month of April. And my goal is to move the determinate tomatoes I'm growing, because I'm doing determinate tomatoes out here this summer, and the peppers that I'm growing out by May 1st. I've had a lot of people ask me lately about success with peppers. And I can tell you that I have had horrible pep pepper years and a couple of really good pepper years and the one thing that I can really pinpoint that has made all the difference is the years that I waited three to four weeks after our last frost date to move my peppers out they did so much better the years that I got hasty and I moved them out as soon as the frost was passed with my tomatoes but where we might still be getting nights that were pretty cold like maybe not freezing but within just a handful of degrees to freezing those peppers ended up being stunting and never producing a lot and what I've learned for, honestly from a lot of my commenters is that peppers will stunt if they ever uh, are exposed to, to cold temperature and even just like a night or two where it's getting close to freezing if you've already moved your peppers out that can cause them to struggle especially if you're putting them out and they're having to endure two weeks of cold but not freezing nighttime temperatures so my plan from now on and after trying it last year and seeing that it was true um my plan is to not move my peppers out till may 1st when my last frost date is april 1st and if it's get, still getting really cold at night by then maybe pushing it out even further which is actually kind of a relief to me because peppers are a little bit slower to get started in seed starting especially if you're doing it like in an unheated greenhouse because they, they really need a lot of heat to take off and so i can start my peppers here in the next couple of weeks and I know they're gonna be really ready to transplant by the time I'm ready to move them out. I'm gonna go check on the chickens. Ooh, it's muddy over here. Hey check out the new garden gate. I'm actually not sure if this is on hinges yet. I think it's not. Oh lovely greenhouse. Look at all these little cuties. I love how different seedlings will look so different right from the beginning. Look at that, that frilly kale, the le it's little leaves, it's so cute. In the past, I've always viewed like the beginning of real like preparation for the garden season to be like February 15th for, this, for the spring and summer garden because that's usually when I start my, my seeds, like my tomatoes and stuff because um, it's six weeks before my estimated last frost date. I don't like to go a whole lot earlier than that. For things like tomatoes because then if there is a delay and the frost comes late i don't want to end up with really root root bound plants or anything really struggling but now that i'm doing a lot of things like onions and and things that can handle the cold weather and of course doing the high tunnel 
you know, there's been steps all through the winter preparing for what's next. I'm so ready for the garden. I'm so ready for the green to come back. I'm so ready for this sanctuary to be back because it is such a huge part of my daily life through a big season of the year that there's almost a bereavement in it being gone. But I'm very glad to just take the steps of the process. I would encourage you if you, even if you are not like a, like a real planner to um, make a list and get your calendar out and figure out what your last frost date is and then count backwards, you know, three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, if you're still that far out, like, you know, some of you are even further than that. But like, make a list of where the days are that you're going to need to do things. Like right now, the first week of February, I need to reset those places in my greenhouse. I need to go ahead and get the rest of my onion sets in the ground or here over the, the next little bit. I, ha I have them, but I haven't planted them all. And and go ahead and do those lists because it's really easy. Like right now, I could be so excited and fixated on starting my tomatoes in two weeks that I don't plant the onions and miss the window for getting those things started. And it is really easy when you're thinking about like the big beauty of the summer garden to miss out on the fact that we well, can actually grow quite a bit of stuff between now and then. I would, I would encourage you guys to make that list. And it also just kind of helps with the, the doldrums of winter and the winter blues. I know February is like the thick of winter for a lot of people. And whereas I'm kind of coming out of the end here, February and into March here in the South, I know a lot of you are still just like slammed in with snow and you're not gonna see anything green for two and a half months. Those lists really do help and, and really outlining things so you can have those little points to look forward to. Something dug up one of my little tulip bulbs and chewed on it. I'm gonna uh, I bet it's a little squirrel. Here's some sunflower seeds that are shucked here. Well, I'm gonna stick it back down in the ground and hopefully it'll do okay. The tulips are starting to peek through. I've got daffodils here and tulips, multiple different kinds. Got another one here, that booger. Look at that. Hopefully those can make it through. Well, they definitely won't make it through if I just lay them on top of the soil to dry up, so it will at least give it a shot by putting it in the ground. Just wait, guys. This space is going to be so full of life in such a short period of time. And yours will, too. Take heart. Winter doesn't last forever. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.